So this is uh, just sort of a quick definitional, uh, uh, providing some definitions for those people who basically like to have definitions. Uh, I mean, for me, basically, I just look at imagination and creativity as things that sort of happen you know, in your brain. And then when we talk about innovation and we talk about entrepreneurship, it's often more the you know, implementation aspect, right? Uh, but this is basically a simple break, break, breakdown. And of course, all of these things interconnect, which is the why we have this sort of circle model in terms of the definitions. So, you know, uh, and I think most of us probably know the answer to this question, but why is creativity, you know, why is innovation important? Uh, basically, because of the world we're living in today, the 21st century, things are really speeding up. Uh, so basically, to tell a story, my father worked his whole life for IBM. Uh, IBM was a dominant computer company in, well, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Then a company called Microsoft started to take over in certain areas. So in many ways, IBM you know, was forced to reinvent itself, to go into services and into other areas. But I think what is interesting is the business model lasted a lot longer right, back then. So in the 20th century, you know, companies could basically do the same thing over and over again for decades. And they didn't really have a lot of competition. But today, if you do that, you know, if, if you just have one idea, if you just have basically one business model, your future is basically very uncertain. Uh, I'm originally from uh, Canada, BlackBerry, uh, originally called Research in Motion, you know, one of our most famous companies. And today we all know the story of BlackBerry. They are struggling. There's always been talk about them being bought out by Samsung and other types of companies. Uh, we could talk about Nokia. You know, I, I think we all remember when Nokia was number one. We all had Nokia phones, number one market share, and of course now uh, basically purchased by Microsoft. Yahoo also, I remember when everyone had Yahoo email, right? And now of course Yahoo is also struggling at this particular moment. And I could go on with other companies on that list. So basically, uh, whether you want to call it the death rate of companies, uh, the churn rate, but things are really speeding up in a number of areas. So I, I, type, I like to think of it in terms of waves. So if you have one good business model, one good idea, it's like a wave. But there's another wave coming behind you, and there's another wave coming behind that wave. And if you're not paying attention to those waves, if you're missing the, the waves that are coming behind you, you're not going to have a successful future. So, it's, so basically, this is why I, I, I view this sort of entrepreneurial mindset is essential for success in the 21st century. It's, it's important for countries, it's important for companies and organizations, and also individuals. And one of the things that I find teaching entrepreneurship in Cambodia now is everyone wants to take entrepreneurship. So I, I teach a course out at the engineering school. I go to the agriculture university. It's like finally, even the medical school, for many years the medical school said, hey, we're not into business, we're, we're basically doing medicine. Now they're interested in innovation. Now they're interested in the medical sector and medical businesses and so forth. So it seems like everyone now gets the idea of entrepreneurship innovation and, and sort of the importance of creativity. Uh, just to give one more story, uh, things are also becoming super competitive. It used to be that you knew who your competition was, that your competition came from basically the same sector. So I'll give you an example. Uh, at the business school where I teach in Cambodia, uh, we have, I think, wow, we have almost 100 universities in Cambodia. That has always been the traditional competition. Now we are facing competition from banks. We're facing, facing competitions from e-commerce companies. So uh, the example of a bank, uh, what basically happened, basically to tell a story, was I was setting up a corporate advisory board for our business school. And I called up one of the major banks in Cambodia that is beyond Cambodia, it's a regional bank. And I've known the CEO there for more than 20 years. And I asked him to be on our corporate advisory board. And he said, sorry, I have a conflict of interest. I cannot be on your board. And I said, what's a conflict of interest? He says, we're creating our own university. So basically, they were taking their training program in, like their internal training program in finance and banking, 
and creating a whole undergraduate program, which I expect in a couple of years will be an MBA program in finance and banking. So if I'm an, a student in Cambodia, do I go to the university where I might have more theoretical learning in, in terms of the education approach? Or do I go to a bank where people actually work in the industry where I can probably get an internship and a job when I graduate? So right now I find that we're facing a lot of competition from outside the education sector, companies, private companies coming into the education sector. So so if we're not proactive, if we, don't, if we don't contact the companies to set up innovative and creative programs, then basically we are going to die. We are going to have our students go elsewhere. So now we're reaching out to Coca-Cola, companies like Coca-Cola on who are experts on marketing, experts on supply chain, and asking them, will they partner with us to do a special program? So they bring their knowledge and expertise from the private sector in addition to the theory, and that is working. But if we don't reach out, if we are not proactive, we will also die. So, um, you know, so basically, it's not just in the United States, it's not just in the developed world, but also in the developing countries, we're facing these same challenges. Uh, Thomas Friedman, great quote from uh, Thomas Friedman. Uh, going forward, we are convinced the world increasingly will be divided between high imagination enabling countries, which encourage and enable the imagination and extras of their people, and low imagination enabling countries, which fail to develop their people's creative uh, capacities and abilities to spark new ideas, start up new industries, and nurture their own extra. So it's also countries, right? So if countries don't have educational systems that encourage innovation and creativity, they are also gonna be less competitive. Companies making investment decisions on where to invest if they don't trust or they don't basically believe that the education systems are moving in the right direction, they are going to go to other countries to do those investments. So again, uh, as Thomas Friedman mentions, it's important at the national level, we saw it at important at the organizational level, and also at the individual level. So basically at the individual level, we're trying to create T-shaped people. And so the idea of the T-shaped person is that you have uh, you know, specialization or knowledge in one particular area, but you also have some general expertise and knowledge of other subject matters. And often that is where you get the creativity, is when you pick an idea from another discipline and you combine it with what you are doing. Like Steve Jobs, right? He, he was focused on technology, but he brought in you know, the art, the design, into the technology. So taking something from design and, and art from this field over here, bringing it into the technology sector. So again, basically this is our aim, to create what we call T-shaped people. Now, one of my favorite methodologies is actually from a book, uh, Jeff Dyer, uh, who was also a keynote speaker, I believe two years ago uh, at, uh, at this competition. And I really like this approach, and I highly recommend it, the book, The Innovator's DNA. And basically, he has five methods to basically, uh, to develop this concept of think different. So basically, this is the idea of how does an individual think different? How does an individual come up with new ideas? Uh, whether it's for existing businesses, uh, entrepreneurship, or whether it's for new startups. So I'm just gonna quickly go through some of these, uh, some of these five discovery skills and provide some additional examples. Questioning. Obviously, you know, people that are more creative, that come up with better ideas, they are questioners. They ask a lot of challenging questions. So it's this idea of curiosity. If you are not curious, I think it becomes very hard to come up with innovative ideas, whether for existing companies or new startups. So I think some people, um, I th well, I think we are all born in terms of questioners. The problem is some people lose this sort of questioning ability through life, whether it's taken out of you from the school, from the workplace. But we all have this sort of, uh, basically we are born, I believe, curious, and that somehow we lose that curiosity. So this idea of uh, asking questions, the importance of curiosity, uh, and how to get that. So basically it's this idea of practice, right? Uh, and so when I say to people that you should practice questioning, it doesn't mean you have to have your hand up all the time, right? Asking people questions. Sometimes the questions can be internal, right? You look at something and you might have a question. Why is this business successful? Why is this business failing? So it's just basically having this sort of curiosity that you develop. And let me just show you a very quick uh, video here. And this is also from an amazing book called A More Beautiful Question.
right? So basically the whole idea of a more beautiful question is this idea of different strategies to develop questioning, including things like question storming, which I will not go into. Uh, but basically they, they emphasize that instead of brainstorming that you should do question storming to come up with the best questions to focus on. So again, this is something that can be practiced, right? We start off when we're born with this idea of curiosity and questioning. Some of us keep it, some of us lo lose it to some degree. So again, it's, it's, it's an, uh, basically something that we can practice and develop and increase our skill. Uh, after questioning, observing. Uh, obviously this idea of uh, pretending to be an anthropologist, uh, studying customers, studying people's problems, of observing in the society. Because I think the key thing here uh, that Jeff Dyer gets into is basically, um, you know, in our life, a lot of us really do not observe, right? We think we are observing. You know, it's like if I, if, after, this, this, after this session here, if I talk to some of you outside and I ask you to describe the room and the people in there, some people are good at that, some people are not good at that. So again, observation is something that we can practice. Uh, we can become more mindful in terms of what we are doing, in terms of the people that we're with, and the environments uh, that we are operating in. So again, observation, and of course that ties into questioning, because when we observe, we have questions. If we, obviously, if we do, don't really observe, it probably limits the type of questions that we come up with. Um, also, this idea of travel, uh, because travel is a type of observation. And what I have found is that a lot of my students have their best business ideas when they travel. Uh, and I'll give you just a couple of quick stories. Uh, one of my students who was in our competition 10 years ago, uh, they started Brown Coffee in Bakery, which now has 11 different locations in Cambodia. Starbucks just came into the market uh, last month. Starbucks was thinking of buying them out, uh, but that broke down in terms of the discussion. Uh, Starbucks went to every one of their 11 outlets and actually identified them as their number one competitor. And we also have Costa, we have Coffee Bean, we have like the Coffee Wars in Cambodia. I can name like 10 different brands of coffee, right? Uh, which is quite amazing that people can afford like, you know, $4 for a cappuccino, but they do in Cambodia. So now, uh, but what is unique about them is basically uh, a couple of things. Uh, three guys, one, uh, Boon Ling, who was my former student, went to Australia. And in Australia, he observed coffee culture, uh, Gloria Jeans, and other brands in Australia. And his, his mission was to bring coffee culture, not to NGOs and to foreigners, but to Cambodians, right? So, and, and to young Cambodians, to university students. Uh, his colleague is an architect who studied in the United States. So what is unique about Brown, unlike Starbucks, if you go to Starbucks, they pretty much all look at the same. At Brown, each one is an architectural uh, unique, right? So they have some amazing designs. So whenever they open up a new Brown location, everyone wants to go to see how did they do the design. They are all completely different. Furniture, uh, building materials, it's an amazing concept, right? That they are actually expanding. And the third guy went to Bangkok to do the bakery. So they had the bakery aspect, they had the design aspect, they had the business guy. So the team, all very differentiated, all with very, very different skills. Uh, one of my other students went to Thailand. She saw all this flavored popcorn. She said, hey, this idea will also work in Cambodia. Develop this popcorn popcorn business, doing a lot of catering uh, for parties, but she also has a popcorn cafe. And as you can see, they have some pretty weird flavors, right? They have some local flavors, they have some international flavors. But again, the idea of observation. So again, I think travel is important. I find that the students, the students that have the best ideas are usually ones who travel, uh, because travel leads to more observation and more questions and basically more ideas. Uh, just a couple of uh, visual pictures here of what does Brown look like. These are some scenes of different brown. So you can see really cool designs, sort of bar style. Uh, also the way they do the coffee, they have these drip coffees. Uh, they actually travel the world, they go to San Francisco, they look at things like Blue Bottle Coffee, which I've never been, but they tell me that that's one of another cool brand in San Francisco. So I really admire that the team, they travel around, look at competitors, not just regionally or locally, but internationally again. And, and they're always innovating, they're always coming up with new ideas, and now they're gonna work with Cambodian uh, coffee farmers to bring in sort of local content. Uh, so it's a really, really cool example. Um, networking. For me, networking is actually one of the most important because, and with networking, it's not just how many friends you have. 
but it's diversity of network, right? So one of my students, she has 30,000 friends on Facebook. And then someone said, well, you can't have 30,000 friends because the limit is 5,000. She goes, I have six accounts of 5,000, 30,000 friends. But, so, you know, but it's not just number, it's diversity. So in other words, how many of your friends are engineers? How many of them are writers? How many of them are artistic? So different specialization, different background, different nationality, different age group. Uh, so diversity is very important. So I almost look at it like you know, collecting friends. In fact, I actually, for my students, I give them assignments because I often find that students are very shy. So at a conference like this, if some of my students will come, I will make a game and I will say, okay, prepare your name card. And at the end of the day, whoever collects the most name cards in terms of you know, interaction wins. Now obviously that's not necessarily a substantive interaction, but again, it's this, sort of this overcome, this fear that people have because most people, when they come into a room, they say, where is my friend, right? And then they go and they sit to their, uh, with their friend, they talk to their friends. They don't come into a room and say, who do I not know and who can I meet based on this limited interaction? So that's really the mindset that you have to have, right? How can I meet, so how can I come to this type of event and walk away with more interactions, more name cards, more, more connections? So it's diversity, uh, meeting uh, different people from different backgrounds. Uh, there's an interesting book called Never Eat Alone. Uh, some of it is a bit superficial, but there are some good ideas in that book. And the idea here is, you know, every meal should be, a, uh, should be used to meet new people, right? Don't have lunch with the same group of friends all the time, right? So in other words, try to use all of your time to meet new people. So I, I very much like this idea. And I find that a lot of my ideas come from network, right, when I reach out to people. And another thing that I do that a lot of people don't do is I contact authors of books. Okay, so most people think that when you read a book, you can't reach out to the author. You can. Most of the books that I'm showing here today, I've actually reached out to the author with a story through an email. Go to their website, get their email, create an interesting subject uh, line, because if it's not an interesting subject line, they're probably not going to read your message. And then create a story. And I always say something about what I'm doing in Cambodia. And if you're ever traveling or visiting Angkor Wat or in the region, I'd love to have you as a guest speaker. I never go to the paid guest speaker side, right? Because I don't want to pay for that. I always go for the free side. But it's an interesting approach. And then you get someone who's never been or might want to be, go to the business school and talk to students, and you develop that connection. And I find some people are very helpful, sharing PowerPoint, sharing resources. So uh, again, if they don't reply, you, you have nothing to lose. You lose about one or two minutes when you basically do that email. And oh, another point is before you do the email, it's always good to go on Amazon.com and give a five-star review. Because usually when they get the five-star review, they get notified and then do your email the next day. And it actually usually works quite well, but just from, just from having. Um, so again, networking is very important. And then, of course, experimenting. Uh, experimenting can be you know, uh, breaking things like uh, Michael Dell taking things apart. Uh, but it can also be things like uh, trying something new, taking a new class, taking a new activity. So I encourage my students, you know, take yoga, go out, do, you know, cooking, do hobbies, because basically this is a way of learning new things. Uh, the idea of failure, take more risk, because obviously if you don't fail, you don't try. So I'm a big believer in failure. Uh, in our competitions, just like here, we actually reward failure. So I think a lot of you will be talking about the failures that you've had in your business model and then talking about your pivots. So it's very, very important to have those stories. And, and so I think when you are failing, it also means that you are trying. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I, I think though the key thing is to fail small, you don't want to fail big, and fail fast, right? So you learn very quickly from those different failures. A uh, good book at Google called Search Inside Yourself. They, I like that idea because Google is about search. So they actually say search inside yourself as a course they teach at Google uh, for engineers to develop emotional intelligence. But it's all on mindfulness. It's basically meditation. So I, you know, for my students in Cambodia who are Buddhist and who don't actually value Buddhist meditation because they think that's something for their parents, when I point out that Google actually has a course in mindfulness, it's like, OK, now they sort of realize that maybe this has merit, right? Maybe something in their traditional culture actually does have value. So I think that's also an interesting uh, 
experience. And then finally, when you bring all of this together, uh, if you practice questioning, observing, networking, and experimenting, it leads to the idea of thinking different, lateral thinking, or associational thought. So let me just show you a very quick video by Jeff Dyer, who does a really good job at explaining this concept. Welcome to the HBR IdeaCast from Harvard Business Review. I'm Sarah Green. I'm here today with Jeff Dyer, whose latest book is The Innovator's DNA, co-authored with Hal Gregerson and Clay Christensen. Jeff, thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. In the book, you talk about the five skills of disruptive innovators. How did you settle on these five skills? What are these five skills? Well, we started about 10 years ago trying to figure out where do disruptive business ideas come from. And we decided the best way to figure it out was let's go study business innovators and figure out exactly where and when they came up with these disruptive business ideas. So we, we talked to dozens of innovators and we found that one group of them were often asking questions. They were questioners. And they wanted to know uh, a variety of things about a problem, uh, an industry, a company. So for example, at um, Peter Thiel and Max Levchin at PayPal, we're asking, how can we be money to other people? And this led for them to come up with the idea that maybe they could attach money to an email, and this led to the emergence of PayPal. Others were observers. For example, Howard Schultz uh, took a trip to Italy. He began observing espresso bars. He loved the romance, the coffee, and he said, I got to take this back to America. He adapted it, brought it back, and, and here we have Starbucks. Um, others were networkers. Um, Mike Lazaridis, who started Research in Motion, maker of the BlackBerry, uh, was listening to a fellow talk about how Coke machines could wirelessly tell the distribution center, I'm out of Coke and I need to be refilled. And he thought, wouldn't it be cool if everybody had like an interactive pager device that could wirelessly send information to others that they wanted to send it to? So networking was, a, was the catalyst for the new innovation in the, in the idea. And, and finally, others were experimenters. So Michael Dell. Um, was an experimenter taking things apart, putting them back together, especially computers during his high school days. And what he learned as a part of taking them apart and souping them up and putting them back together is he could do it for 30% less than IBM could provide a, an off-the-shelf computer. And so, you know, the Dell Direct model was born. So those four behaviors, questioning, observing, networking, and experimenting, um, were behaviors that triggered associational thinking. Um, this is a cognitive skill where we're able to sort of connect new things together to create something new. So for example, when Steve Jobs um, attended some calligraphy classes and learned about sort of beautiful typography, he then took those ideas and associated them with creating great typo typography on a computer, and voila, we had the Macintosh and desktop publishing. So these are behaviors that actually lead, trigger uh, creative ideas and we found that those behaviors, if mastered, can help anyone to improve their creativity and their ability to be innovative. Okay, so I, I very much like that approach. Uh, I find it's a very effective approach. And again, it's a question of practicing these behaviors. I think the concepts are quite simple in terms of you know, questioning, networking, obs observing, experimenting. Uh, but again, it's a question of how you practice them in your daily lives. Uh, the next method I just want to quickly talk about are the four lenses of innovation. Uh, the idea of challenging orthodoxies, which is basically questioning, right? We question the way we do things. Like, for example, here we have a, like a, a lecture type setup. And I am standing and you are sitting. And so I often say to my students in Phnom Penh, why? Why don't we have a standing class, you know? If we had a standing class, what would be the advantages? Well, uh, health advantages. It's healthier to be standing than sitting. Um, people would be much more focused because people would not be playing on their you know, Facebook and on their mobile phones if you were standing. Uh, a lot of companies now in the US are actually doing standing meetings. 
And they're also finding that they're shorter, right? So obviously you have to shorten the time. You can't do like a two hour standing class, but you could do a half an hour or 40 minute standing class. Uh, and you would probably have to do some structural redesign in for writing in terms of elevated desks for people to write. But it's a very interesting um, you know, thing. Sometimes we do things over and over for many years, but we never ask the question why. Or why do we do 50 minutes? Why do we do a two hour class? You know, what is, is that more for the a faculty benefit? Is it more for the, the student benefit? So always asking why. I saw a great, uh, I don't know if any of you watch Shark Tank. I love Shark Tank. I get a lot of ideas from Shark Tank. And someone asked, someone actually challenged the shape of the wheel. You know, the wheel we've been using, it was called Shark Wheel. And they had like skateboard and other designs. And they had a cube shaped wheel. And so the question is, we've had for 5,000 years, the wheel has been round. So they decided to question that. Why round? Is there a better shape? And they actually came up with a cube-shaped wheel that works better than the round design. And they put it on baby strollers. They did it on skateboards. Uh, you can download it. It's called the Shark Wheel on Shark Tank. An amazing presentation. But again, they had this idea of challenging orthodoxy, right? They take something that we just take for granted and they basically challenge that. The second one is harnessing trends, basically looking at trends in technology, social trends, population demographic, and looking at opportunities. So for example, Amazon, Amazon uh, Books. Uh, Jeff Bezos didn't really do that because he was passionate about books. He looked at the internet, he saw the internet as a future, and he was asking the question, what businesses will be disrupted? Where is the opportunity? And he saw the opportunity in the book business to make a, a, a significant disruption. Uh, so basically looking at trends, looking at changes around you, and say, how can I tap into that with new innovative ideas for startups. Leveraging resource, here it's not just what resources you have, but also what resources you can partner with outside of you. So for example, our university reaching out to Coca-Cola to do a joint marketing program is an example of us leveraging resources outside of our uh, institution. And obviously the most important from this conference is understanding customer needs. You know, a lot of good ideas start with problems, customer problems, pe problems that people face. And if you can deliver a really good solution relative to competitors to solve those problems and pain points, that's often the source of a good business idea. Uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, Harnessing trends, drone technology. So now Amazon is saying, okay, drones are becoming very popular. How can we use drones? So now they're looking at it for delivery purpose. Now, whether this is going to be the future, I don't know. But you know, whether we're all going to have our drone pad and have our, our boxes delivered you know, on our roof or something like that, kind of interesting. I saw this one a couple of weeks ago, Domino's using, uh, this is in Australia, they actually have a droid delivery service where you punch in your code, up comes your hot pizza, and they have like a cold storage for the drink. Whether this is the future of delivery, uh, interesting idea, but again, they're looking at changes in technology and say, how can, how can we add that into our business model? I think the best example of the four lenses of innovation are air, bed, and breakfast. Uh, I assume everyone knows Airbnb, uh, the story of Airbnb, but it's an example of all four lenses of innovation. So basically, it starts off with this problem. Two guys have an apartment in uh, San Francisco. They, the landlord wants to increase their rent. They don't have enough money, right? At the same time, there's this big design conference in San Francisco. All the hotels are booked up. All the guest houses are booked up. No place to stay. So there's a customer problem. And then they ask a challenging question, or they challenge an orthodoxy. Would people pay money to sleep on our floor? So if we did like an air mattress and we provided a free breakfast, would people sleep on our floor? Which is a resource, right? So they're harnessing a resource that they have. And then later they harness other people's space in terms of putting it up on their website. And so, you know, this is an example of the, of the four lenses. And in terms of the trend, the sharing economy, right? So we're at a point now where people don't want things mass produced. They don't want to just stay in big hotels, which look the same in every country. They want homestay. They want something local. So they tied into this social trend of the sharing economy and hence created this amazing uh, company, which is now valued at more than $10 billion, right? So basically, when I, when I taught this uh, case to our students in Phnom Penh, one of my students had some extra property in uh, near Angkor Wat and Siem Reap. She calls her aunt, 
and they have some rooms and they put it up on Airbnb and now they're making money, right? So I, I always like when I, I, I do a case in class and some of my students figure out how to make money from this idea. Uh, so I mean, w whether you're in Myanmar, whether you're in Cambodia, it's amazing how air bed and breakfast has penetrated all of these developing countries. And so in Cambodia, it's not just the capital city, it's like three or four different towns all up on air, bed, and breakfast. So it might be a couch for $10. It might be a villa at a much higher price tag. Uh, but it's an amazing idea. And it's an example of also all four lenses of innovation. Let me jump here, because uh, our time, we just have about 15 more minutes. Systematic inventive thinking is something that I'm also quite interested in. I'm not going to go through all of the different examples, but obviously, well, for me, one of my favorite is subtraction. Subtraction means you take something away, okay? And less is more. And um, like, if, for example, if you look at the, the new iPhone coming out, the iPhone 7, they're subtracting, I think they're going to subtract the sound function. You know how you have the, your headset and you plug it into the phone. So they're going to subtract that so they, they can make the phone much thinner, and then you're just going to use Bluetooth technology uh, for listening to music. If you look at the, the new Mac book, right? Ultra thin, no ports. Basically, you're using your power port also to connect with a, an adapter. This is an example of subtraction method, where you take things away. I mean, if you look at the, um, the iPad, right? It's basically a laptop where you subtract the keyboard, subtract half of it, and then you change the, uh, the monitor with touchpad and, and, and so forth. So this is what we mean by subtraction. And I'll give you a, for, a few more examples. I'll talk a little bit also about multiplication and attribute dependency. Um, one of my favorite examples of subtraction method in Phnom Penh is a place called Dine in the Dark. I don't know if you have that in the US. It exists in several countries around the world. Basically, they subtract light. So you go into this restaurant in Phnom Penh, it's 100% dark, okay? There is, after one hour, you see nothing. The people who serve the food are blind uh, individuals. So they obviously can function in the dark. It's not a problem for them to work in the dark. And so it gives you the experience of what it is like to be blind. And so when you go into this place, you basically have to put your hand on the shoulder. And the, the waiter comes down. He basically, downstairs, they have light. And you don't know, by the way, the menu, you don't know. They just ask, are you allergic to anything? You have a choice of like vegetarian food, Cambodian food, international food. They don't tell you what, chicken, beef. They just ask you, do you have any allergies? You must give up your phone. No light objects allowed. So phone, they have a lock box. They take away any watches that have light devices. They lock that away. The waiter brings you up into the restaurant and literally, uh, now you, they do give you an apron, but the reality is actually you don't spill anything because you're ultra careful. And basically the food comes and you just have to, you can't even use a spoon because you sort of got to use your hands and scoop it. And then of course you have no idea what you're going to eat until it reaches your mouth. So it's basically using other senses other than sight. So it's a great experience. This is what it looks like inside. So this is basically what you see. And literally, even after one hour, you see nothing. Um, the joke was, well, what ha happens if you have to go to the toilet? Well, it's not in the dark, OK? If you just call the waiter, they bring you downstairs, and they have the toilet downstairs. It was a bit of a joke, like, you know, do you do the toilet in the dark? And I actually had the guys who did this come as a guest speaker to our university. So he is one of the founders. These are uh, some of the staff who are blind, who, by the way, are also studying for university degrees. Uh, she was mentioning to my students, she's on Facebook, but she does it with special technology for voice. So she can do all of the posting. I mean, my students were quite amazed. When he came to give this talk at our university, he said, Steve, do you want me to do this in the dark? I said, no, no, I think we should have light for the talk, right? So they do other events in the dark. So it's not just dine in the dark. They have poetry in the dark. They have a lot of different events that they do in the dark. So this is an example of subtraction method, where you take away something, and it creates excitement. It creates value. An example, Mercedes-Benz concept car. They ask a really challenging question. Why do we need the steering wheel? What if we take away the steering wheel? And not only take away the steering wheel, what if we take away the pedal for the acceleration and the brake? And so the logic here is they studied younger generation who are doing video games. People use with a joystick, right? So they said, why not have a car, Mercedes, with a joystick? So no steering wheel. So basically everything, acceleration, direction, motion, is in the stick shift. 
almost like a Boeing plane in many ways, right? Okay, five minutes. So uh, again, this is an example of subtraction. And of course, you create more space for the driver. It's a concept car. Whether this will catch on in the future, I don't know, but it's an interesting idea. I'm gonna move very fast because we just have five minutes left. Google, they subtract the driver, right? Driverless uh, cars. Um, another restaurant, and this one actually is in Toronto. I'm originally from Toronto. Instead of the dine in the dark, here they take away sound. So it's called signs. The waiters are basically uh, hearing impaired, and or they are deaf waiters, and you have to use sign language to order food. So you're not allowed to order food uh, in, in terms of uh, your voice. Everything must be done through sign. So they sign language. So they basically teach you on the menu. So you come away learning how to do sign language or basic sign language for food. It's a social business because they're giving jobs uh, to people who are deaf. And again, it's an example here of not subtracting light, but subtracting uh, sound. There's a short video on it, but we don't have time for that. Uh, last year when we were in Utah, um, I think it was last year or maybe two years ago, we, went, we visited a company called Qualtrics. Uh, as part of Silicon Slopes in Provo, just outside of Provo, Utah. And this was an example also. We, we talked about the standing, you know, standing desk. So here they subtract the chair. So a lot of offices now have standing desks. Uh, and of course, what you have to do is you have to elevate the desk, right, if you take away the chair. Uh, he sort of defeated the health purpose because he had a lot of junk food, you know, potato chips and stuff like that. Um, uh, one other technique, another quick one, multiplication technique. So, multi so subtraction is taking away something. Multiplication is when you increase one component. I was in Paris over the holidays at Christmas, and I took this picture, a three-wheel motorcycle, two wheels in the front, not in the back. I've never seen this before. And initially I thought, oh, it must be for disabled or elderly. No, it was young people driving this in Paris. So I started to ask a lot of questions. Why would you want to have two wheels at the front? and one wheel at the back. And it turned out that it solved a problem unique to Paris, the idea of the cobblestone uh, roads. They get very slippery when wet. So by adding the second wheel at the front, it gives it more traction for going fast and taking uh, you know, sharp cor corners in that. So it solves a unique problem. It probably would not sell well in, you know, in, in Seattle, I would assume, right? But for older cities who have a different type of surface, it was sort of an interesting solution to a problem. Another one of my favorites, this one is attribute dependency. Attribute dependency is when you take things like price, temperature, time. You know, think of Domino's pizza. It used to be 30 minutes or free. So if time is beyond 30 minutes, the price drops. So attributes are things like time and price and color and temperature. This one, Samoa Air, is by weight. They charge people based on how heavy they are. Because if you think about it, fuel cost is the cost of a plane, right? So if someone is 200 kilo and someone is 100 kilo, why should you pay the same price? So often price is something that you can innovate, right? A lot of price is a great source of innovation. So basically it's combined weight. It's your, not just your bag, but also the individual combined weight of the person. So there are also health benefits, of course, because if you lose weight, you get a better price. They are being sued right now, obviously, by people who are saying, I am born overweight, and this is discrimination. But it's an interesting business model, right? Um, so I, I, I very much like this idea of uh, you know, this example of attribute dependency. And so if you think about this, what other things? You know, universities, we charge, if you think about it, based on nationality. Foreign students pay more than local students. In the US, you have a price for in-state, out-of-state, international. Are there other ways that you could charge students? Charge them on weight? I don't think that would work. Charge them on height? I don't think that would work. But the idea, I think, is having this mindset of what if we do this? What if we do that? You might have like 10 different ideas, but maybe one of those will be successful. So again, it's having this sort of mindset where you say, what about this? What about that? And it might be a crazy idea, but just by asking that question, you might actually come up with something that would actually work. Uh, another example of another technique called reverse assumptions. Uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you know Muhammad Yunus. Uh, he came to speak uh, in Phnom Penh a couple of years. He is the father of microfinance. And basically, how did he start up microfinance for Grameen Bank? He saw a problem. He was a university professor, economist in Bangladesh. He saw people were poor. Uh, he saw that they had good business ideas, but no money. So he created microfinance. 
But what did he do? He knew nothing about microfinance sector, so he did the opposite. He said, traditional banks, what do traditional banks do? I'm gonna turn this 100, you know, uh, basically turn it on its head and do the opposite. So, for example, traditional banks focus on wealthy climates, clients, they're gonna focus on the poor. Traditional banks focus mostly on men, we're gonna focus on women. Uh, traditional banks require collateral, we are not going to require collateral. Clients must come to the bank, our bank will go to the client, we will go to the village. So basically he said, we did the opposite. We said, you know, obviously traditional banks are not working for these people, so what if we did exactly the opposite? Would it work? And they created the whole microfinance uh, industry. Okay, I think I'm pretty much finished here. Um, again, the importance of team. Uh, having diverse teams, I believe, is very, very important because people are your most important resource. You might have a great idea, but that idea might only get you five years, right? And then you've got to come up with another idea. So again, for me, people are more important than the idea. Having the right diverse team, the right mix, is going to lead to many ideas for your organization. Um, final note, uh, remember creativity can be learned uh, by uh, practicing, observing, questioning, experimenting, and networking, leading to thinking different or lateral thinking. Uh, practice four lenses, uh, practice some of the systematic inventive thinking, and then my final slide, here are some of the books that I'm basing uh, today's presentation on. And again, I highly re uh, recommend The Innovator's DNA, I, I, one of my favorite books. Uh, and the SIT, Inside the Box, thinking is also quite interesting, a little bit different from Lean Startup, because with, with SIT, you focus actually on creating a solution first and then basically asking, does it solve a problem? Sort of the opposite approach of Lean Startup, but also some great ideas. Thank you very much.